Joining us today to discuss, we have our Chief Political Correspondent, David Crow and Brendan Coates, the Economic Policy Director at the Grattan Institute. Welcome, gentlemen. G'day, Jackie. G'day. Brendan, earlier this week, the government announced major reforms to our immigration system. Can you tell us a bit about those reforms and what really stood out to you? Thanks, Jackie. Well, we've seen a flurry of reforms from the government essentially trying to deal with the exploitation of loopholes in the visa program. The biggest one is really about cracking down on non-genuine asylum seeker claims. So there's been an issue for quite some time that basically if you make, if you're onshore, you come as a, a, on a tourist visa or as a student visa holder, you then basically make a claim for asylum onshore. That process ends up going through the courts for up to a decade. And during that time, you get work rights and you can stay and work in Australia. And so that's been exploited systematically by criminal gangs and others to basically bring people here to be exploited. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what the government's trying to do is to reduce the length of the process of us processing those asylum seeker applications and having them run through the courts. So we've got $54 million to establish real-time priority processing by the Department of Home Affairs. There's another $58 million to the Ministry of Appeals Tribunal and the federal court system to try to get through that backlog of appeals. And another $48 million for legal assistance for applicants that have put in asylum claims. Beyond that, there's also more money for the Department of Home Affairs to essentially establish a new division uh, for immigration compliance and um, visa integrity. And so some of the things that came out of the Nixon review and, and you know, the Nine Papers reporting of, of the, the exploitation we've seen by Operation Inglenook, you know, that's now being embedded permanently in the Department of Home Affairs. So they're trying to really step up the capacity of the department to identify these kinds of uh, these rorts that are going on in the system quicker to try to stamp them out and deal with the problems that we've seen emerging. Um, David, Brendan there has just uh, referred to the Nixon review a few times. Can you just explain to people who are unfamiliar what that is? And also the review was, of course, announced in response to damning reporting from our newspapers, The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, in conjunction with 60 Minutes. Can you just remind us what the reporting showed and then what the government response with this Nixon review was? The reporting showed uh, horrific exploitation of people who were brought into Australia on, on various kinds of uh, migration visas. And that was reporting led by Nick McKenzie at The Age in Melbourne. Uh, Michael Bachelard was also involved at The Age in Melbourne. And it was a, an entire series of reports on human trafficking, including some really dodgy characters, one of whom was known as the Hammer, uh, who brought in people including sex workers. There was a case study, for instance, on a sex worker brought in from South Korea who ended up working, you know, she had to work three months long, nonstop. She ended up with a debt, you know, a fake debt really to the syndicate that brought her in. And uh, her passport was confiscated when she came in. So this triggered, you know, much more concern in government and some frustration, I think, among ministers that the media was finding out about these stories and reporting it when their department wasn't doing enough on it. I think that there's a, an element of frustration there. Uh, and so that led to uh, the Home Affairs Minister, Claire O'Neill, asking the former Victorian Police Commissioner, Christine Nixon, to lead this inquiry. So that began at the end of last year. They received the report in March of this year, and now we've got the response. Yeah. Brendan, the rorting that was exposed by that reporting, as, as David just said, was really shocking. It amounted basically to modern day sexual slavery in some cases that's happening right here in Australia right now. Uh, the Minister for Home Affairs, Claire O'Neill, was very strong in her language um, this week and she placed the blame for all this visa rorting firmly on Peter Dutton's shoulders. She was really strong on it um, as, it, you know, he of course was famously, you know, a sort of hard-nosed former Home Affairs Minister. Do you think that she is right to blame him. Um, should the blame for this or the responsibility for this be shared more equally amongst government and public service? Where does, you know, how did we get here? Yeah, it's a great question. So certainly um, the government, the former coalition government was in power for essentially a decade leading up to last year in 2022. And so they've been responsible for the migration program and the visa system, um, including the establishment of the Home Affairs Department uh, back in 20, 2013, 2014. And so certainly a lot of these issues have been known about for a long time. I don't think we knew the true extent of the horrific, um, you know, examples that have been documented by, you know, the Nine Papers and by um, Christine Nixon. But the issue of the extended delays in processing asylum seeker claims and people making 
really what are non-genuine claims for asylum on shore once they've come on another visa. You know, that's been an issue that's been around for a long time and known about for a long time. So certainly a lot of the responsibility for what we're seeing here does relate to the tenure of the former coalition government and to Peter Dutton, who was the minister, you know, up until relatively recently. He was the Minister for Immigration. And then once the Home Affairs Department was created, he was the Minister for Home Affairs from 2017. Uh, At the same time, there does appear to have been a step up in the sophistication of criminal networks and their use of visa systems, both in Australia and around the world. So it's an issue that a problem that's built up and where Australia is not alone in facing these kinds of issues. Um, and we've, but we've also seen, I think, a pretty clear deterioration in the ability of the department to be on top of these issues. A lot of the Department of Home Affairs sort of framework for managing risks in the visa system basically relate to when you first cross the border, when you come from another country and arrive in Australia. And the kinds of issues that we're seeing here are actually more what happens once you're in Australia and say you go from being here as a tourist visa holder to then applying for a student visa or applying for asylum. Uh, And that's where a lot of the issues appear to have emerged. And the department's budget doesn't appear to have grown in the way that you would probably need it to have grown in order to manage compliance and to crack down on these kinds of things. And it does appear that the government, or particularly the former government, was very slow to get on top of this. So to be fair to... I think Claire O'Neill is broadly right to put a lot of the blame on this on the former coalition government. Um, Obviously, what happens from here, how they tackle this from here will be their responsibility. Peter Dutton hit back at those criticisms and he he actually criticised Claire O'Neill in turn and said that she was aggressive and that she was very angry. And he defended himself and said that um, he cancelled the visas of over 6,000 bikies, criminals, drug dealers, rapists and so forth, and that this government hasn't done anything like that. Um, David, is he right to defend himself, Dutton? Oh, I think it's a fair defence in terms of the visa cancellations and so forth for criminals. Uh, We did see action when Peter Dutton was minister against criminals. We also saw that they stopped asylum seeker arrivals by boat, which is a policy that many Australians were concerned about. And so I think that is a reasonable defence. But he went beyond that defence really to to frame the asylum seeker problem as purely one for labour. And as Brendan noted, that's been building over many years. And it it really grew to uh, great scale under the coalition. They were in power for nine years. And it was the problem that they bequeathed to the Labor government. One frustration I've had this week in in writing about this, in going to press conferences and in reporting it, is the lack of speed, basically. Some of the problems that uh, are now apparent or are now being acted on were being warned about in 2018 and 2019. The pandemic arrived. That changed everything in migration. Numbers changed. Numbers slowed. You know? However, the underlying problem has been there for years and Labor warned about it in 2018 and Labor warned about it in 2019. Labor then took office in 2022 and they've taken until October 2023 to unveil this week's package. Mm. I think that's too slow. And so I think that a, a clear finding is that the numbers that we now have to deal with are the bequest of a, of a coalition government. Okay. Uh, there is an argument for Labor to have moved a bit more quickly on it. Okay. And just on that, you were at the press conference this week um, with the Home Affairs Minister, Claire O'Neill, and you asked a question about the number of visas that were being approved by the current government, by her government. You said that the current net migration figure has already surpassed what was predicted in the May budget. Can you explain what you were getting at there and why the number might be higher than, than anticipated? The number's higher than anticipated because of this surge in people coming into the country after the pandemic. But it's a moving target that the government's really uh, got to deal with. That is the job of government to handle this this policy area. About last year, we were thinking that that there'd be an increase in net overseas migration. Students would return to Australia after the pandemic. It was only as recently as May in the budget that they forecast that that number would grow to 400,000 in the last financial year, the year to June 30. At the time, I was reporting on that number and I thought, okay, well, look, that's a big increase, um, but they've got steps to, to manage that increase. Since then, it's turned out that net migration has grown to 500,000, not 400,000. So in the space of months, we're now dealing with a 
a different a different inflow. A lot of it's foreign students who've come in. It's not a capped program. It's a demand driven program, but that is a concern. And in fact, Claire O'Neill acknowledged that the changes announced this week should have an impact on net migration. There is an overall tightening of the system, but I think there's a question about how long it's going to take to get there. The long-term forecast for Australia is that net migration will fall to 235,000 people a year. So it's not meant to stay at 500,000 per year forever. That's certainly not the policy goal. The question is going to be in the execution, what steps they take to make sure that they get back to a more reasonable level of net migration every year. Brendan, the context, the wider context for this debate is that Australia is in a global arms race to attract the best international students to study and then stay, stay permanently. But according to you, you wrote a piece for the nine newspapers this week that the po- saying that the post-study work rights we offer are too generous and we're offering false hope to many international graduates who believe they'll get a job and a path to permanent residency, but in fact, they never do. Can you just tell us what your argument is there and what um, steps the government might take to fix that problem? As David said, there's a lot of international students coming to Australia. Australia has um, a very vibrant and large international higher education sector. Um, It provides big benefits to Australia, but one of the things that we do is we offer fairly generous work rights to international students once they've graduated from their university studies here in Australia. And in fact, we offer more generous work rights than competitor countries like New Zealand or Canada or the UK or the US. Uh, and the issue is that the, we're offering people the right to stay and work in Australia, which is a good thing because you want to jet to identify the best students to stay permanently. Uh, there's a huge benefit that we get from selecting the most talented students for per, the limited number of permanent skill visas we offer each year. But the problem is that we're offering false hope because we're offering people the ability to stay in Australia for, you know, in some cases up to eight years if you've studied at a regional university. So you can stay and work after you've graduated. Um, it's more like four or five years for bachelor's and master's students in the cities, depending on what they've studied. Uh, and that's led to a big increase in the number of graduates that are here on those temporary visas. Uh, but there's only a limited number of permanent visas available. And so, you know, we've gone from a world where a few years ago, about two thirds of those temporary graduate visa holders, that's the visa they hold once they've graduated from a university here, that used to, two thirds used to get permanent residency after that visa. Now it's down to one third. And, you know, our estimates are that partly as a result of decisions made by the, the current Albanese government last year at the Jobs and Skills Summit, they extended the length of those visas, how long you could stay. That was done in the context of widespread skill shortages and concerns from business about having enough workers here and in the country. But what it's done is it's going to lead to a big increase in the number of those temporary graduate visa holders here in limbo. So we expect those numbers... It was about 100,000 in 2019. It's 200,000 now, so it's doubled basically since the pandemic. It's going to be closer to 400,000 by the end of the decade. And the problem is, is that having so many international graduates that are stuck in limbo, uh, it's in no one's interest. It's not really fair on the students themselves because they've been sold a false promise that if you come to Australia, then potentially you'll be able to stay. And the reality is many won't. It does threaten the, the public confidence in the migration program because we know that in periods where uh, we have large number of temporary visa holders that that tends to erode confidence in the program. When we have large inflows of migrants, that tends to erode confidence in the program because it feels like, you know, the government's not in control. And it's also a threat to, the, to our reputation of our international education sector because a lot of these students are going to get disgruntled, disgruntled and eventually have to go home. Um, and so, you know, this is a problem that actually sits at the government store that they have increased the length of those work rights and it actually runs the op- in the opposite direction to the stated rhetoric of Claire O'Neill and, and Albanese as Prime Minister, that they want to reduce the number of people here in permanently temporary visas. Uh, this is going to take it in the other direction. And it's going to add further to population growth and net overseas migration numbers at a time when you know, the rental market is in stress. And public concern about those migration numbers is right. right. Yeah, you did make that point in the piece that these lax visa conditions, as you see them, are leading to further pressure on the housing market, which is a very politically touchy sort of subject. David, I want to ask you, do you think that the, you know, the opposition is already sort of intimating that um, it will um, exploit this as a political opportunity to talk about um, labour migration and, you know, these enormous population pressures that we're seeing come to bear, particularly with the rental market and the housing market more generally. Where do you think the opposition is going to move on this? 
this this whole debate is going to get harder and harder, sharper and sharper, uh, all the way to the election. It's a political opportunity for Peter Dutton and for the coalition migration spokesman, Dan Tian for a very simple reason. It's a matter of genuine concern to a lot of Australians. They can see the pressure on infrastructure. They can see the pressure on housing. Uh, they can see that rents are going up in the major cities and they're wondering about what measures are going to bring those factors under control. I'm not suggesting that migration is the, you know, the root cause of every problem, but it's a contributing factor to things like housing shortages. Uh, population is a subject of great interest to a lot of Australians. And some of the things that Brendan was just outlining highlight, I think, a really fundamental question about whether migration is working for us. And that is a genuine pressure point. At some point during the term of this government, the debate shifts from what Peter Dutton got wrong in about six years as Home Affairs Minister, when he was responsible for a big blowout in some of these numbers. The debate shifts to, well, what's Labor done? And I think they don't have as much time as they'd like to think they've got mm. because it's now October 2023. By the time we go to an election in 2025, the question will be, where is the proof in the numbers that you've actually addressed this and turned the trend around? Brendan, just going to that point that David makes, I mean, the picture on immigration can be very confusing for the average sort of punter. On the one hand, we hear that the system's being rorted, um, more migrants means greater population pressure. But on the other hand, business and the business lobby is always saying that we need more migrants, there's a shortage of skilled workers. What is the real story? Um, do we need more migrants or less migrants or different mix of migrants? Look, I think that's a great question because it kind of goes to what the migration program is for and public understanding um, of the migration intake is actually pretty poor. You know, it's a complex system. You've got a permanent program. It allows people to stay permanently that has a certain number of visas a year. But a lot of the dynamics around population are driven by the temporary program in the short term where you see big spikes in students coming to the country or working holiday makers. Now, we actually don't think that the real purpose of the migration program, particularly the skilled program, which is the bulk of it, is actually not about dealing with shortages. Um, I think that's the, the common public understanding, but it misses the fact that migrants also spend money in Australia. So while they may fill jobs, they also create demand for more jobs. Uh, so the big benefits that we actually get from the migration program aren't necessarily so much from filling shortages. It's particularly for the skilled program, it's because Migrants come when they're relatively young, they're typically, say, 25, they've either been educated abroad or they've paid for their own education here at Australian universities. And then we get them to stay and live and work in the Australian community for up to 40 years if they're permanent visa holders. And the big benefits, the biggest ones, are actually the fiscal dividend. It's actually the fact that we, they pay far more in tax than they ever draw in services, including the pensions or healthcare. For the typical skilled migrant, that's upwards of $300,000 over their lifetime. It's, a, it's like a migrant shows up in Australia and hands a cheque for three hundred grand to the Australian government. That's kind of what it's like. And what that means is Australians have to pay less in taxes for the services that they enjoy. There are obviously other, other benefits so they can contribute to productivity growth if they've got knowledge that they bring to Australia. Um, and they have costs, so they obviously impose costs in terms of rising, increasing pressure on housing, which is where the big issue is at the moment. They're not the main driver of unaffordable housing in Australia, but they are a factor and one that the public thinks and sees that the government should be able to control. Mm. Brendan, we're going to farewell you now and thank you very much for joining us. Um, that was an interesting debate and we'll probably have you back on because I think this will probably come up again. Thanks very much, guys. And David, you and I are quickly going to have an update on The Voice. Um, it's now a week until the referendum and I personally have noticed this week that both Anthony Albanese and Peter Dutton have started talking about what happens after the vote? I'm um, in very guarded terms in Anthony Albanese's case, but what what have they both said? Albo sort of talked about how, at the very least, the referendum debate will have brought to the fore um, issues of Aboriginal disadvantage and get people discussing them. Yes, it was an interesting argument from Anthony Albanese that he was really trying to emphasise the positives of the debate on the voice, and I think that's a well, anyway, his argument was it's been worthwhile to raise the question, raise the issue of the treatment of Indigenous Australians because that's a debate worth having on multiple levels because it'll guide us in the future about how we respond to some of those problems. Now, 
I think that he was trying to make the best possible case for a, for a debate that's been quite ugly in many parts, has given rise to some racist rhetoric, has given rise to accu- accusations on both sides, yes and no, that the other side is, is guilty of racism. So it's been, you know, not always a, a, a happy debate mm. and he was trying to make the best case for it. I don't know whether that gives us much of a clue about what he will do after the vote. I'm not presupposing an outcome, and so let's see what happens. Peter Dutton did make some comments this week about what would happen in the event of a no vote getting up. He said that the whole exercise will set back reconciliation and damage our reputation internationally, um, and that Albo has been led by the top end of town on the voice uh, referendum and has, has lost touch with ordinary people. They were sort of pretty damning comments. I just wonder if you think that is the tenor of criticism that the opposition will take in the event that no gets up and whether or not Anthony Albanese will be personally damaged by a no vote. Look, I thought that that was rhetorical overreach by Peter Dutton. I mean, he he claimed things, including that Anthony Albanese was being led by former Qantas chief Alan Joyce uh, in his policy on The Voice. I think it's very clear that the, that the ultimate guidance to the government on this policy on The Voice came from Indigenous leaders such as Noel Pearson. It's their model. That's what Anthony Albanese is pursuing. That makes it a very big ask, I think, at the referendum. And ultimately, a lot of those questions come down to whether they got the decision right in terms of what they put forward to the Australian people. The big end of town line, though, is something that we keep hearing from Peter Dutton um, he has thrown in what I would call casual falsehoods, uh, such as that um, Anthony Albanese keeps having Alan Joyce around for dinner at Kirribilli House or the Lodge. Not true, according to the government, but you can see the trend there. He's going to paint Anthony Albanese as the friend of big business and uh, Peter Dutton as the friend of the battler. That's the dynamic that is set here. What it says for life after the referendum is is not clear. And, uh, Peter Dutton did talk this week about getting an audit done of federal spending on Indigenous Australians, but I think it's a bit too early to to assume how the how the dust will settle after the vote because on each side they're going to have to recognise the reality of the outcome and adjust accordingly. Uh, neither side can go forward after October 14 with the mindset that they've got today because everybody will be waking up to the reality of the vote and adjusting policy in the light of what the people of Australia say. And we'll be getting into that more next week, which of course will be the last um, of our podcast before the referendum vote on Saturday the 14th. David, thanks so much for joining us. That was an interesting discussion as always, and I will see you next week. See you then, Jackie.